Hello, my name is Sean Ennis from Ennis Management, and thank you for joining me here once again on the Creative Collective. And today I'm honored to be joined by a very special guest. She is a musician, actress, radio producer from Bronx, New York, Nubia the MC. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining me for the interview. Yes. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is talk to me about growing up in New York um, during the emergence and, and really growth of hip hop. Well, it was after the disco era, the 70s, when hip hop started just coming out. This was before records was playing. I myself am not from the Pioneer era. I was in the audience watching the Pioneers on stage. We had all our clubs like Harlem World and Disco Fever where they would showcase all the hip hop greats. And this was right after Disco, like I said before, and right around the time where New York was playing a lot of dance music. And what was what was that transition like um, as far as the culture, maybe the fashion going from disco to hip hop? Well, it included the disco because remember, hip hop wasn't always about sneakers and sagging pants. I mean, you had the men, the young men who was dressed up and the women that was dressed up going to school, making sure he was clean. You know what I'm saying? Um, the transition was pretty, it was a big demarcification between disco and hip hop because everything changed. It was more break beats and break dancing and rapping on the microphone. And anybody, not everybody could do it. Not everybody was talented, so you had to be real special to get up on those turntables because the DJ was the element that was showcased the most, quiet as it's kept from the rapper. And that's that's really interesting, and because I think um, for for my generation, being born in '85, we really saw a kind of diminished importance of the DJ. So, can you talk about what an important role the DJ played? early on in, in hip-hop? Well, the DJ was the first MC. See, the thing is, is that the DJ would say, this is uh, DJ so-and-so, and I'm playing this music, and I'm doing this, and they would have their own rap. It wasn't until hip-hop that came when the DJ and the MC split. The duty of the MC was to tell the crowd was such a good DJ the DJ was. And the first uh, MC, his name is Coke La Rock from Cool Herc and the Herculoids. Now you see a lot of diminished, prompt, like you said, um, promotion of the DJ. But it's coming back, you know, it seems to me like all you got to do is put out a mixtape and you're an international DJ. But if you can't do all those turntable and tricks and mix the record from side to side and cut the record on beat, you're not really doing hip hop. Can you talk to me a little bit about hip hop going from kind of being on the outside and or, or I would say underground and kind of getting... Um, more acceptance in into the mainstream culture? Yes. It's really not accepted because it's not respected. Hip hop is all about love, peace, unity, and having fun. And it seems like the mainstream wants to keep it criminalized. And that's not fair. It was invented by children. It's the culture in and of itself is to break up fights, not to start them. And it seems like whenever you hear the word hip-hop nowadays, it's all about beef and, and problems. But that's not how it was invented. It was invented to stop gangs from fighting, killing, and violence. And that I think, was the original intention. And I think the... 
there was there was used to be more of a balance in in urban entertainment with the presence of R and B to kind of off balance the um, the the gangster rap. So so there there was there used to be a lot more of a balance. I feel. Yes, there was, but then again, hip hop was never innocent, really, because there was still misogyny. There was still talk about drugs. They were still talking about beating people up, you know, in the rhymes. It just was far and few between. It wasn't, you know, thrown down your throat. And it wasn't, you know, exploited as it is now to the point where young kids don't know how to discern fantasy from reality and emulate gangster rappers and get themselves in trouble. That's why I wrote this record called Gangster Boogie to address all that. that that's a great point. Can you talk about that song? Yes, Gangsta Boogie basically is a little warning for 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds of what they should expect if they decide to sell drugs before they make that decision, not after. Absolutely. That's, that's certainly really important. So, let me ask you... Um, can you talk about the ethnicity of your parents and what effect that had on you growing up? Yes, my father's from the South and my mother's um, family come from uh, Antigua, Barbuda, the Caribbean. And that gave me the interest of listening to African rhythms, Caribbean rhythms, and that good old Southern gospel. As you know, R&B comes from gospel, hip-hop comes from R&B, funk, folk music, quiet as it's kept. So without the gospel, you don't have the roots. That's why hip-hop has changed. That's why the rap music doesn't sound the way it is, because the, those that are making the music are not rooted in the church and those Christianity hymns mm -hmm. that make the rhythm go like butter. Do you think that the style of music is a reflection? Because, you know, like, like you mentioned, hip-hop is really a, a young man's game. So you think that the, the hip-hop that's being produced today is very different from the hip-hop during the golden era? Or do you think it's a reflection of these young kids growing up in, in this, you know, turbulent, fast-paced, internet, fast information moving society that we're currently in? I think, I think it's both. But the latter is definitely indicative of where their mindset is. Real fast money, real fast relationships. See, they didn't grow up with soap operas where a story took a long time and there was love involved. They grew up on reality shows where everything's quick, quick, quick. And you have to make quicker decisions, it seems, to, to just do nothing. But um, I think it's coming around because a lot of R&B and a lot of soul music is still being produced. It's just not as prevalent on the radio as you would hear other people who do got the money to promote themselves. That's the name of the game. It's really not a young man's game because I'm in my nifty fifties and I'm still rapping. And I've rapped in front of um, 20 year olds and millennials and they get the message and they love it. And one thing that I often say when, when people try to overgeneralize hip hop as just gangster rap, I point out to them that you know, three of the biggest artists in in hip hop and the world right now are Kanye West, Kendrick Lamar, and J. Cole. Right. They're in the middle of the dial. The radio dial is playing them in pop music genre. So, you know, a lot of people would argue whether that's hip hop music or not. First of all, and another thing that I wanted to touch on that you mentioned, in because I, I work with musicians from all different types of genres, and 
And, um, you know, there, there's contemporary R&B, there's Americana, there's folk. In these different genres, uh, there's classic rock. In these different genres of music, they've made a space for their elder artists to continue being played on the radio, continue touring, continue being streamed, selling merchandise. In hip-hop, being a quote-unquote young man's game, I think there's a real, you know, we're, we're not doing a great enough job taking care of those people that paved the way and really brought hip hop music to the to the forefront help pave the way for for where we are now can you can you talk about that actually that's not the truth in new york city if you want to hear classical hip hop come to the bronx the ones that started it are still doing it the greatest of all time uh, female, the queen of hip hop. I'm sure you know who that is. That's Sha Rock from the Bronx. She's producing a movie right now, a documentary style movie about her life. She's the first female to ever have a record deal. First female to ever be on television Saturday Night Live. She's the only female in a hip hop group, the Funky Four Plus One More. You got Stevie D from the Force MDs of Staten Island, still singing. And he was hip, uh, rocking hip hop before the music even hit on wax. So if you really want to come to the Bronx and experience classical hip hop as it is and as it was, you're going to have to walk into that museum that the Bronx is building. Wow, I am so happy to hear that. And can, wait, so can you talk to me more about the museum? Yes, the museum is being built from the ground up, and it's going to feature all the pioneers of hip hop, the golden era, the old school era, and beyond. It's going to be a beautiful place. It's going to be a tourist attraction. It's going to be in the Bronx. There's a lot of fundraisers going on to help with the building of it. But it's going down, baby. I am so happy to hear that. We we really need that. Mm -hmm. Now, can you talk to me about your experience at Clark Atlanta University? Yes, I was a mass communications major, minor in, in journalism. And I learned a whole lot about my history, myself, and the world from my perspective as a young black female. I was cultivated in the arts. I learned uh, a lot about discipline. I loved that college campus, Atlanta University. And that's when I first moved to Atlanta from Athens, Georgia, from New York City. And it was a heck of an experience because I got to meet black, uh, young black college students from all over the world. Virgin Islands, Africa, Chicago, everywhere. And you've also done some extensive work in in the field of community radio. Yes, I'm still doing it. I'm with a nonprofit organization called Creating Unity in the Community. And what we're doing, our next event is June 22nd. We're going to have a celebration of the ending of slavery with Juneteenth, which is the first national holiday that African Americans ever celebrated. It's gonna be at the Bronx YMCA, starts at 3 p.m. and we're gonna have food, it's a fundraiser, we're gonna have entertainment, it's gonna be very nice. Wow, that sounds like an amazing event. Now, can you talk to me about your work on public access television? Yes, during the golden era, a lot of hip hop uh, was featured nationally, internationally, and locally. When I was in Atlanta, I had a radio show and a cable TV show. The radio show was called The Underground on WRFG 89.3 FM. It was uh, started Monday after midnight from 3 a.m. to 6 
and we was able to keep all the expressions intact because it was uncensored radio. It wasn't commercial radio. All you had to do was um, pledge a donation, and that kept my show on the air. With cable TV, it was produced by Tariq Masheed of uh, Hidden Colors fame, if you know his videos. Absolutely, I recognize his name. Yes, yeah, Tariq Masheed. When he uh, was living in Atlanta, he produced a hip-hop show that featured the videos. This is when videos was first popping in the early 90s, in the golden era. So if you really wanted other people to know about your record, you had to produce a video. Now everybody's streaming. And I think that the video being streamed now is... Um, taking off like a rocket. Can you talk to me about your experience on The Spot That Rocks? Yes, that was when I was 19 years old. I was influenced by Kiss Rocks The Spot, which was a hip-hop show produced by Shabazz and Easy Eric on in LaGrange, Georgia in the late 80s. I was 19 years old, and what I did was I wrote a proposal to the program director of WXAG 1470 AM about how we need to involve the youth in radio. He agreed. We set up an uh, hour's time, and we interviewed a lot of young teenagers that were involved in the community. We broke a lot of records, Ice T's record. I remember we broke, we, we played a lot of hip hop from the 80s, and we made sure that there was no curses, there was no profanity, there was no misogyny. We tried to find out the most positive record on the album. But it was a good experience because I was very nervous. <laughs> this was my first time on radio. But I was able to tell everybody in Athens, Georgia, and the surrounding areas about hip-hop because they never knew it before. And is that something that's important to you, providing opportunities for, for young people and also musicians? Yes, that's why I host the showcase nowadays. It's called Uptown Soul. It's in Harlem on 7th Avenue. Every Monday, every third Monday evening at 7, from 7 to 11 p.m., whether you do com comedy, spoken word, poetry, R&B, singing, jazz, rapping, or reggae, we will put you on stage. You, there's no fee to perform. And we, we're getting ready to stream a lot. We did three shows so far, and it's been pretty successful. And Pojani Fleury is the CEO of Uptown Soul. She's the one that puts me on stage. And my job is to introduce each act to the audience. For a $5 fee, you get 10 acts. And they do, each, each performer does two songs. And if they want to sell their CDs, they can sell their CDs. If they want to network, they can network because we invite underground entertainment industry personnel like booking agents, managers, host of other showcases, promoters, radio, TV, magazine, and podcast representatives to come and mingle with the performance so they can get to that next step. Wow, this, this sounds like a tremendous opportunity and um, showcase event. Why was it important to you to be a part of this? Because I know how it feels to get from point A to B. I've done a lot of shows. When I first came out with my EP, Grown and Sexy, I put five songs on a, a CD. And I test marketed it for three years. And each summer, I sold 2,000 copies. The only thing I didn't do was put a barcode on it. And, that, and, and now... I'm going to finish up my album and do like nine songs and two skits, put it on a CD, get a barcode, start streaming, 
and start doing my showcases here again. All over the city, all over the state, and the tri-state area. And you... Just for starters. And you've done quite a few uh, performances yourself as a musician, am I correct? As a rapper, yes. I also endeavor to become a songwriter for other so uh, people who do songs like house music, gospel, R&B, bringing R&B back, and neo-soul. And international music as well. I'm very happy to see international music come, come back because... So Makosa should not be the only African record made by an African on the airwaves where black people live here in the, in, in the United States. Are you done talking? <laughs> and Joanna, jo, jo, Joanna, I, I like those songs. I'm oh. glad they're making success. Okay. Can you talk to me about a memorable, a memorable past performance? Yes, the Apollo Theater. I came in fourth place. I was um, doing my hip hop record, Voice in the Darkness. And when I first came up on stage, a lot of people probably think that I, w I was gonna start singing, but Capone introduced me as a rapper from the, a female rapper from the Bronx. I walked up in there, I broke the ice, and as you know, you have four to 10 seconds to, uh, Tell the audience what you all about with your performance before you get booed. And I must say, and I'm proud to say that I went from beginning to end with nothing but cheers. You can see that video on my Facebook account, on uh, my entertainment page. And be on the MC. And so, I mean, performing at the Apollo, I think every every musician knows about what a tremendous venue and atmosphere and landmark experience performing at the Apollo is. Is that is that something that you'll remember for the rest of your life? Oh yes, and I have the certificate. I mean, James Brown played there, got booed. Um, Luther Vandross played there, got booed. Lauren Hill played there and got booed, and they all came back to win Grammys and have successful careers. So for me to come in my naughty 40s and do hip-hop in front of that international audience with that energy and not get booed, that tells me I'm going places. Wow, that is really special. So, can you talk to me about, uh, and I believe this is your first single, Be All You Can Be? Yes. Be All You Can Be, I wrote that a long time ago. And it was on the compilation album for the Middle Passage Project, which was a fundraiser CD to raise money for... Um, a monument it was a gravestone marker if you will to be ceremoniously lowered 427 kilometers off the east coast in the Atlantic Ocean to serve as a head marker headstone for all the Africans that died in the Middle Passage so I wrote a song that spoke about 100 million black people dying in the Middle Passage as part of a compilation CD to raise funds so those uh, markers could be built and put into the ocean. And much to my surprise, it was playing in the radio at Fran in France. That was in 1999. Wow. That, that's really amazing. That's, that's, that makes me so happy to hear that. Yeah. And you... Um, you have and you released an EP, Grown and Sexy. I believe you said it was five songs. Can you list some of the songs and talk about them? Yes. One song was Gangsta Boogie. That was the big hit. That was produced by, rest in peace, the late great producer from the Bronx, Ross Kira. And it had a boom bap bass line boom bap beat with the reggae bass line. 
And that was just a little warning to all the 14 and 15 year olds of what would they be up against if they decided to sell drugs before they make the decision, not after. Then I had another song that was that sample Teddy Pendergrass called Shanquasia, which talks about a young girl from Brooklyn who's in love with a drug dealer and they trying to make it through life in the urban inner city. Then I have Voice in the Darkness that um, I played at the Apollo that's just also produced by um, Ross Kira, who it, 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 was, it was boom bap and it's more like a street anthem. My other producer, DJ E-Man from Mad Lab Studios in Mont Haven, the Bronx, also produced uh, part of my EP called Grown and Sexy, the, track, the title track. And that um, is a naughty 40s type record where it's a party record. I'm going to a party. I meet this guy. We also had a video on it. And he takes me for drinks in the VIP, rides me around in the limousine, and is very grown and sexy. So you've you've written uh, songs um, on a wide variety of different topics. So let me ask you, what inspires you to make music? Everyday life, fantasy, reality, my dreams, my nightmares politics, my world point of view. I listen to a lot of news. I get a lot of perspectives about things. Discussions with people about different politics and subjects of discussion. Now, what advice can you give for an aspiring musician or a musician just starting out on their music career? Don't waste time with people who don't believe in your dream. Invest in your dream. Don't look for a free ride. Definitely don't do that. And get to as many shows and seminars as possible and learn all you can about this business and get a lawyer. That's some great advice. Can you, can you elaborate on the importance of artists getting out there and doing live performances? Yes, because you don't know who can see you. You know, a lot of a lot of these um, festivals out here cater to the underground independent artists. You might have to pay a little fee to perform, but if you got yourself together where you are you are registered with a publishing company and you have your CDs with a barcode, that was the only mistake I, did, I, I made, was that my CDs didn't have a barcode, and it counts towards sound scan and counts towards, you know, going gold or going platinum. Yeah, go out and do your shows. Because after you get on stage, if they like what they hear, they'll buy the CD and you'll gain a following. Do as many um, interviews as you can. Pay to get into the magazines if you need to be. Get you a booking agent and take off. Stay serious, stay focused. Absolutely, that's some great advice. Now, this is a question that I like to ask musicians, so I'm going to ask you. What is your dream collaboration? If you could collaborate with any artist, alive or one who has passed on, who would it be and why? Stevie Wonder, because of his death. His because of his death, yes. That's a great answer. Now, do you want to talk about your new album or new music? Well, yes. I'm, I'm writing new music as we speak. Um, I'm talking to people who have radio shows like yourself, getting my contacts and my clientele ready to promote my new album when it comes out. And um, that way, when um, it does come out, I'll have a head start promoting it. DJ E-Man is one of my producers. Uh, 
Rest in peace, Russell Kill was one of my producers. And right now, I'm looking for producers now who are established. I'm probably going to tap Zulu Thomas Simmons from Wild Pitch Records back in the days for a tune. As long as it's hip hop, I'm going to do it. Can you share your social media links? Yes, I'm on Facebook. Nubia the MC. N U B I A. Then the next word is the. Then the next word is M N C. Nubia the MC. Anytime I'm performing, I put the flyer up and let you know where and when I'm going to be performing. Where I'm going to be performing so you can come see me. I'm all around the city. I'm doing the showcase hosting in Harlem, so that's every month. And anytime I move out into the tri-state area or anywhere else outside the state, I put that information in. All you have to do is like my page and you know where I'll be performing next. Is there anything else you'd like to promote or share? Oh, just remember to watch me on Orange is the New Black. I'm playing a featured extra and I'm mean grilling all through the movie in season, season 7 on Netflix. Well, I can't wait to see it. Yes. Well, I'd like to give a very big thank you to my guest today on the Creative Collective. As always, write your comments below. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this video. And for all of your promotion, marketing, and music career consulting needs, email ennisproductions at gmail.com.